Hello, hello everybody, this is TiptopMTG here today with another Strixhaven news video. In today's video, I'm going to be breaking down all of the spoilers that have come out today, today being March 25th, uh, the first day of spoilers. Now, I do want to say I'm technically not breaking down all of the spoilers. Uh, let me talk about what's going to make it into this video. So first off, all of the Mystical Archive cards are not going to be in this video because there is going to be a separate video for them because there are so many of them. On top of that, I am not including any commons for the most part, so I'll essentially just be covering the uncommons, rares, and mythics, and commons that I find interesting. I don't really think you guys need me to look at a 2-2 for 2 and say, hey, this is for draft. Um, and so, unless the card is particularly interesting, it's not being included. The one exception to this, and because I think they are interesting, are the Lessons. Uh, they're a new card type, and if you haven't seen the mechanics video I did, you guys should check that out, but... Yeah, it's a new type of um, card, and it is very integral to a mechanic of the set, and so I'm going to be reviewing all of the lessons um, and all the modal double face cards. So basically, if it's an interesting comment, I will cover it, but if it's something that's boring and I don't think is that interesting, it won't be in the video, just to save some time, because even just doing that, we still have a lot to talk about. So let's jump into this. Starting off, we have Professor of Symbology. It's a two-cost white creature core cleric 2-1, and it says when it enters the battlefield, learn. And learn is a new mechanic for Strixhaven, and I'm going to break it down very slightly. I, I go into more detail in my mechanics video, but essentially, you can search your sideboard for a lesson card, which is an instant or sorcery, and you can put it into your hand. Or you can discard a different card, so not this card, discard a different card, and then draw a card. So, pretty cool. Uh, it allows you to kind of get add some value on top of all your other stuff. Um, I think it has a lot of potential, but it really depends on what the lessons are. I expect this to be mostly a, like, uh, a limited type thing, where it's going to be pretty good in uh, draft and sealed if you are playing with learn and lots of lessons and things like that, because it lets you go get the perfect card. And it seems like most lessons are colorless not all of them though um, but the thing is it also has that discard a card to draw a card so it can be pretty good even without lessons on top of that it is just an ETB but maybe if you are doing something with like Thassa or the ability to double enter the battlefield triggers maybe you can do something interesting with this but you can really only activate learn 15 times per game outside of limited where you can have an as many cards as you drafted, but in like a constructed format, you get 15 slots in your sideboard, and that's assuming you don't want a real sideboard, so yeah, it's really going to depend on how good learn is, but I, I think this is mostly here for limited and um, stuff like that. Next, we have Archmage Emeritus. It's a four-cost blue creature, human wizard 2-2, with Magecraft, another mechanic. It's very similar to Landfall, where it itself really doesn't do anything other than classify an ability type. So all of creatures with Magecraft have an ability that starts with, whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, so that'll be on every Magecraft card. This guy will have you draw a card, which I think is honestly crazy. For four mana, yes, it is a 2-2, but... It seems really crazy for things like Storm, where you can turn every single card into a cantrip. Um, it, if you can make an infinite loop of copies, which essentially you do by copying a copy spell with a copy spell. So you need two copy spells, you can draw as many cards as you want. Um, Magecraft is, goes infinite with any infinite copying of spells loop. Um, and so... It, is, it has the potential to be very powerful, but even if you're not doing looping stuff with it, it just lets you gain tons of value. I mean, if you are using a shock on an opponent's creature, yes, you're killing their creature, and then you're replacing the card in your hand. That's pretty awesome. I just built an awesome um, kind of uh, uh, historic deck, sorry, <laughs> that focuses around Arc Like Phoenix and Conjured, Collected Conjuring. Oh my gosh, I can't think of card names today. And this would fit perfectly in it, because that deck wants to just cycle through all the cards and, and like, get Arclight Phoenix out of the graveyard. Very fun stuff. Very, very powerful. I think we have uh, Whirlwind of Thought right now, which is an enchantment for six in three colors that whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you draw a card. This is a little bit more specific, um, but it also has that potential to go infinite, which I think is powerful. Next, we have Confront the Past. This is one of those lessons, and you can tell that both based on the type line and in the upper left, there's a little symbol, but it's X and a black for a sorcery. 
This is a nice homage to Gideon's sacrifice in War of the Spark. Um, either way, it is a sorcery, and it says choose one. Return target Planeswalker card with mana value X or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, or remove twice X loyalty counters from target Planeswalker and opponent controls. So you could almost say you're either like taking down um, maybe Nico Bolas from the past, or you can save Gideon. You can you can't take him down and save Gideon. Uh, you kind of have to do one or the other. Um, but really, it depends on what happens in the story. Maybe he she manages to go back and save his life. Um, it'll be really interesting to see. Um, it is a lesson, of course, so that means you can bring it from your sideboard, and I think it's a pretty good card because of that for two reasons. First, your deck may not run a lot of Planeswalkers, so you may not care about that Planeswalker Resurrection ability until you draw that Planeswalker, in which case then you may want to get it later. But also, maybe you don't want to have specifically Planeswalker removal in your deck, but if someone happens to play a Planeswalker, this is a removal spell that can be fetched by cards. That's pretty powerful. I mean, uh, anything that lets you go get something from outside the game, if what you can go get from outside the game is removal, it is very powerful because instead of putting a spell in your deck, for instance, destroy target planeswalker, that can be a dead card in a lot of situations. And this card can essentially say destroy target planeswalker. Um, but if you can put a card in your deck that says go get a removal spell of your choice, that's where we get to some very powerful stuff. And so I think this is a pretty good card. And if planeswalkers become, or if there's a problematic planeswalker in standard, I think it'll be pretty powerful. I also love the fact that it's not just destroy target planeswalker, it's dynamic. I mean, Kazmina is being introduced and she starts with two loyalty she goes then up to three but it means that you can kind of fluctuate like you don't have to spend as much to deal with a cheaper walker and I really like that either way next we have storm kiln art artist it's a four cost red creature dwarf shaman 2 2 and it gets plus one plus oh for each artifact you control so caring about artifacts and then magecraft whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell create a treasure that is is insane okay combine this with the card that makes you draw a card whenever you cast an instant or sorcery now you're adding a mana essentially and drawing a card every time you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell that's crazy because if you fill your deck with those cards and then a bunch of one cost spells that do something you just kind of go infinite or infinite enough this on its own is crazy. First off, infinite loop. Again, what I'm saying here is, you know, with an infinite loop, this just generates infinite mana and gets an infinitely big creature. Okay, that's pretty good. But also just kind of getting a one discount on all of your instant and sorcery spells, that's pretty good. And the fact that that discount can actually just be saved up for a future turn, this card is crazy. Like, so insane. I'm going to build something with it. It is that crazy. And it's that uncommon Honestly, this feels like such a rare, or maybe whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell, but every single one in every turn. That is pretty insane. Maybe I'm misevaluating this, but this seems really good, even at four mana. Um, I built a deck, you know, I'm going to build a deck around really cheap, kind of stormy stuff uh, using these cards. It's going to be really fun. Either way, next we have Dragon's Guard Elite. It's a two-cost green creature, human druid, 2-2, two, two, and it has Magecraft, so whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. All right, that's pretty good. Um, one thing I do want to mention is Magecraft is in all colors, and while I think that's interesting, I think the blue and red ones are going to be the best, because you're going to want to put those in a deck that has have other instant and sorcery mattering cards so for instance that's why i thought that one card uh, the one we just looked at was really good because it can it, it go with existing strategies versus you know this is pretty good but you're gonna have to build this in a very different way and i'm not saying that's not possible i'm just saying that it doesn't have nearly as much support as blue and red magecraft cards do however this thing is kind of self-contained because you can also pay six mana and double the number of counters on it now, green doesn't necessarily have instant and sorcery decks, but they do have fight spells, ramp spells, and all of that, and I could see if your deck was heavy on that, maybe you're in commander and you have a I'm gonna make things fight deck, maybe this goes in it, because not only does it keep getting bigger, um, but it's also a pretty good target to have fight things because it gets big, so in something like that, it seems pretty interesting. In standard, um... I could maybe see this going in a mono green deck just because it is a 2-2 two -two for 2 that if you're casting your um, Lovestruck Beast Adventures or your Ram Throughs or any of those spells or you know even if you're running like Cultivates or something, there is a pretty decent amount of support in those things and as soon as you cast one spell you are getting a 3-3 three -three for 2. 
which isn't awful. So I could see this maybe slotting into a green deck, and then it also gives you a mana sink later on to maybe get you that creature that you need to win the game. So I, I think it has some potential here. I don't know necessarily if we're going to see green Magecraft decks. If we do, we're going to need a lot more payoffs than just this. All right, next let's move into multicolored cards. We're going to talk about the Apprentice Cycle. They are the two-color uncommons that are supposed to kind of signal what each one's going to do. So let's see what they have to say. It's Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, until end of turn, spirit creatures you control gain tap. This creature deals one damage to each opponent. Okay, so they care about Magecraft. They care about instant and sorceries, therefore, but it's really caring about spirits, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, it, it's kind of a weird effect. It's like... Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, and then it's an effect you really can only do once. The only difference is, that, like, if you play out with spirit, you get the effect off, and then you create another spirit, uh, and then you get the effect off, then the second one also gains it, because it's not limited to once per turn. But, um, I don't know how much I like this card necessarily. It seems like it would be pretty good. If it did one damage to target creature, it'd be insane, but I guess it is a 2-2 two, two for 2, so if you are in limited, you're definitely picking up this card in these colors, but it does definitely require you to be running a weird mix of spirits and instants and sorceries. I know there are some instants and sorceries that create spirits, so maybe you can get something going with that, but we'll really have to see the support to see how this card pans out. Next we have Prismari Apprentice. It is an is it creature, human shaman 2-2, and whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, Prismari Apprentice can't be blocked this turn. If that spell has mana value 5 or greater, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on uh, Prismari Apprentice. So from all the cards I've seen in this color combination, it seems to be about going big, which I think I predicted at some point because I was they said like the Prismari really like a spectacular show and I'm like, oh, they're going to be caring about big spells. Uh, and so you're going to get a bonus for like spells and then you're going to get a really big bonus. Maybe not really big in this case, but a big bonus, bigger bonus if you are casting expensive spells, uh, which does kind of go against the storm way. Um, but it definitely, I think, differentiates it from is it who's all about kind of casting as many things as they can um versus this is more about like going for that really big and awesome play that you like really dream about of like oh i'm gonna cast this for x equals 10 um so stuff like that next we have quandrix apprentice it is a simic creature human wizard 2-2 whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell look at the top three cards of your library you may reveal a land card from among them and put that card into your hand i am so glad that did not say on the battlefield i would have been Highly concerned if it's set on the battlefield. Either way, put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Pretty good. I mean, for two mana, whenever you cast a spell, maybe draw a card. I mean, one in three cards in a deck are land. Um, so that's pretty good. In decks that want to go for specific lands, like maybe a Gates deck in Historic, um, or lots of decks in Commander, they're going to definitely want this. Again, a lot of the time you're going to have those incidental instants and sorceries, but also a lot of the time ramp decks are really casting a lot of instants and sorceries. And if we take a look at something like Historic, where we have Explore and I think Gross Spiral is still legal, there's a lot of instants and sorceries that let you play extra lands, which then can synergize really well with putting the extra land in your hand. So I think there's definitely a home for this in something like a Simic ramp deck. Next, we have Silver Quill Apprentice. It is a Orsav creature, human warlock 2 2. And whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, target creature gets plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn. All right, this one's kind of, I would say, generic and boring. I don't really know what the guild is going for. Um, I might say, you know, this the Gwandrix is about land, maybe. Um, but, you know, the. the I keep wanting to call them is it prismari or about big spell that maybe they like combat boosting which isn't something we see necessarily a lot in black and white but we'll have to see next we have witherbloom apprentice it is a golgari creature human druid 2 2 and whenever you cast an or, or copy an instant or sorcery spell each opponent loses one life and you gain one life so it's kind of that um drain effect um uh, it'll be interesting to see again where that's going maybe it's something with life gain or maybe it's something with direct damage uh something that maybe they don't get to see a lot because i want to basically explain why i'm doing some of my predictions they essentially said that hey these cards are based on the differences between the colors rather than the combinations so like while on is it well on is it oh my gosh i can't get he apparently take my mind off of blue red um on I almost said Eldrazi. What is up with my brain? On Ravnica, like, is it is blue and red, and both blue and red care about instants and sorceries, so that's what the guild does. Golgari's black and green. They both care about graveyards. Boros is about combat, and both 
red and white have that. So they said they wanted to kind of do the opposite with this set, and we'll have to see how that kind of pans out. I think I've said that exact phrase a couple times now, so I'm going to stop saying that. Either way, let's move into another cycle, which is the Dean of. Each school has a Dean of, which is a modal double face card, and it's supposed to kind of show two opposites. So we have Dean of Chaos, Dean of Order, and those are the leaders of Lorehold. So um, this is going to be a lot of uh, text, so let's jump into this. It's a two-cost red legendary creature, Orc Shaman 2-2. Two -two. Tap, discard a card, draw a card. Pretty good, actually. I mean, there's a lot of decks, if we're going back to older formats, that care about discarding and drawing, and just being able to tap to do that's pretty good, uh, especially in, like, older maybe madness decks. I, I, I like that. Uh, but it also just kind of lets you cycle through your deck. Then you can pay five and tap and reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a non-legendary, non-land card with mana value three or less. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Put all revealed cards not cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order. All right, so this is definitely going in, like, Chaos decks, which I think is part of the plan, uh, where you just don't know what's going to happen. That's kind of the style of a Chaos deck, is you're going to play lots of crazy spells that are going to just end in, you know, no one knowing what's going to happen, and that's kind of what's happening here. This is kind of a weird version of Cascade that you can repeatedly trigger, and I actually think that's pretty fun. Um, but what's interesting is if we go over to Augusta, it's a three-cost white legendary creature human cleric and it says other tapped creatures you control get plus one plus oh and other untapped creatures you control get plus oh plus one whenever you attack untap each creature you control so it's kind of giving everything vigilance but then you can tap any number of creatures you control and you might say why would you ever want to do that the answer is if you'd rather have your creatures get plus one or plus oh plus one you can tap them so let's say they have a two two and you're swinging with a two two you can instead of making it a three two you can then re-tap it to make it a two three so it allows you to kind of do more tapping shenanigans where the creatures where they're safe to attack you can give them some extra uh, attack and let them block, but the creatures that are just barely able to attack, you can give them some extra toughness. Um, one thing I want to note is these cards do not accomplish the same thing. I'm sure you could find a deck. I mean, I say they don't accomplish the same thing. They kind of do in the sense that both are relying on kind of small things. For instance, uh, Plarg over here goes and gets something with mana value three or less, but Augusta over here is caring about probably having lots of creatures, so her effect is more prevalent. One thing I do want to know, Plard goes for a non-legendary non-land card, I mean, he can't go get himself, so I wonder if this is going to become some sort of combo thing. The only thing that kind of stands in its way is the fact that it costs 5 mana to activate that ability, um, but that's kind of interesting. Either way, next we have... Ooh, Vilda, Dean of Perfection, 3-cost blue legendary creature, Jin Wizard, 2-2, two, two. and you can tap, and you may exile an instant or sorcery card from your hand and put 3 hone counters on it. It gains, at the beginning of your upkeep, This if this card is exiled, remove a hone counter from it, and when this the last hone counter is removed from this card, if it's exiled, you may cast it. It costs 4 less to cast. So this is kind of... Kind of, kind of, kind of, suspend. The big difference is with suspend, you pay a mana cost and then it counts down. With this, you're just tapping and then you kind of suspend it, but you didn't invest any mana yet and you invest the mana when you cast it. Um, so that's kind of interesting and it's actually cheaper. So suspend cards are generally cheaper, like their mana cost is cheaper or their suspend cost is cheaper than their mana cost. Not always because sometimes they have special effect when you specifically suspend them, but this is kind of interesting. It can maybe get you something a little bit earlier um maybe you like play this turn two if you can ramp turn one I, i'm talking about standard and historic here um maybe like with a mana dork and then you turn two play it turn three tap it at that point you better recast in something pretty expensive but you also do need to have the mana it's only four cheaper so i guess maybe an ugin you can play this into it's kind of interesting but then your opponent knows it's coming so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out i don't know if it's good or not i'd probably have to just play with it first Either way, next we have Nasari, Dean of Expression, 5 cost, legendary creature, Efreet Shaman, 4-4. Four, four. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of each opponent's library. Until end of turn, you may cast spells from among those exiled cards, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. Whenever you cast a spell from exile, put a plus one plus one counter on uh, Nasari. So, 
This is really interesting. I think this one's a lot more fun, but both of these are very commander feeling, but they don't feel like necessarily the same commander. They feel different. The first one's about kind of cheating on mana cost by putting things into exile, and the second one's about taking your opponent's cards and casting them as your own. One thing I will note is that if you have Nasari out, you will get a counter on Nasari when you cast the spell with Uvilda. So that's kind of interesting if you happen to like draw two of them, they do kind of synergize in that way. Um, but like you can't take the cards that you exiled with Nasari and like suspend them with Uvilda, which I thought, you know, could be kind of an interesting idea where you're taking those cards and you're suspending them because you can only cast those spells until end of turn with Nasari. And if Uvilda could like exile them and then cast them later, it could kind of get around that. And I thought that could be kind of interesting if you managed to pull two of them. Um, but nope, uh, it seems like these are just interesting effects and you're probably putting them in the deck for their effect, not for both of their, like some of the modal double face cards, you play for both of them, um, you know, like, oh, I forgot his name, the White God from Kalbheim, he is a, a like, a sword on the back and himself on the front, and his, they both care about in equipment, but these ones, and so you're putting them in the deck knowing that you sometimes will cast them as this and sometimes cast them as this, this feels more like I'm gonna put this in the deck knowing that 99.9% .9 of the time I'm gonna cast Nasari, the only time I'll cast Uvilda is if I need a chump blocker or something, so I feel like that's also the case, it's also kind of allowing for two color commanders, maybe with a one color design. Um, but yeah, I think that Nasari is more interesting to me personally, um, but I, I think the fact that they don't necessarily go in the same deck is interesting, and I don't know if I like it. Next, we have Valentine De Dean of the Vein. It's a one cost, so it's pretty cheap. One cost, one one legendary creature, vampire warlock. It has menace and lifelink. And if non token, if a non token creature an opponent controls would die, exile it instead. When you do, you may pay two. If you do, create a one one black and green pest creature token with. When this creature dies, you gain one life. So you're going to kind of stop death triggers on the opponent side, where you'd normally be expecting black to have death triggers. I also love that the like. I don't know, it's a death trigger, but it's stopping other people's death triggers. Uh, something about that just seems really interesting to me. It's also asymmetrical, that's pretty cool, and making the 1-1 one -one does cost mana, which is why it's a 1-drop. If it didn't cost mana, it would have been like a 4-drop. Uh, Menace Lifelink is not bad at all. So yeah, I, I, I like that card, honestly. Uh, and then Lizette, Dean of the Root, it's a 4-cost uh, green legendary creature, Human Druid. Um, and whenever you gain life, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control, and those creatures gain trample until end of turn. Now, these, these two seem like they were meant to go together. I mean, hmm, like, okay, look at the previous two. Yes, you could make an argument for a deck wanting both, but for weird, different reasons. This deck is clearly a, I'm gonna gain life and go wide. I mean, the, that's what Lizette says, is gain life, go wide. And Valentine lets you go wide, and lets you gain life. So if you're missing the way to gain life and missing the way to go wide, you play Valentine. If you have that and need some way to profit off of it, you play Lizette. So these seem more interconnected than the uh, Prismari ones do. And, and maybe that's just me. Let me know what you guys think. Is there something I'm missing between the two Prismari ones where uh, I would necessarily want those in the same deck? Like, I think they're both interesting designs. I just don't see wanting them at the same... I see wanting them at the same time. I don't see wanting them in the same deck. Either way, next we have Kian, Kian, Kiana, 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 her, Dean of Substance. It's a three cause green legendary creature elf druid. We just did get a bunch of elves, so it'll be interesting. 2-2, two, two, tap, exile the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it into your hand. Otherwise, put a study counter on it. Oh, Exile. I was like, wait, you're putting counters on the top of your library? What? Um, so yeah, another one caring about land in, uh, oh my gosh, Quandrix. Sorry, it's going to give me some time to get used to these names. So Quandrix is looking like it's going to be Simic Land, which I don't think anyone wanted more of. Either way, you can pay five and create a zero, zero, zero green and blue fractal creature token. Put a plus one, plus one counter on it for each different mana value among non-land cards you own in Exile with study counters. That's interesting. I thought it was going to be like, make a 0-0, zero, zero, and when it dies, you'll know, return something with a study counter to your hand. But no, the cards that get exiled with study counters just kind of sit there. Uh, so you want to throw this in a deck with lots of varying CMC cards. Um, multiple double face cards 
only count for their front face, just so you know, but they're kind of useful because you can have a card that's maybe, I don't know if there are any of these, like seven on its front or uh, whatever, and then cheaper on the back, and you're probably never going to play the seven drop, but if you exile it, uh, it's useful in that situation. Either way, then we have Ibrahim. It's a four cost blue legendary creature bird wizard 3-3 with flying and you can pay X blue blue and tap to exile the top X cards of your library and put a study counter on each of them. Then you may put a card you own in exile with a study counter on it in your hand. Okay, these ones obviously want to be on the field together. Like, super clearly... I want to have Kiani here as the payoff and Embraham here to kind of get things done. So in Commander, you're going to play the guy on the right first, exile a ton of stuff, and then you're going to throw out uh, Kiani or whatever her name is. This is one where it feels like they were meant to work together, but they're doing very different things. I think this is one where it works the best, where they, they are very clearly doing things that are their own color, but when you put them together, they create an interesting effect. Um, now, in something like Commander, where you can't have both out at the same time, it'll be interesting to see how this does, um, and I don't know if necessarily this is good enough for standard, necessarily. Of course, if we do see the return of Simic ramp decks uh, to very high prevalence, maybe this will be a nice mana dump that you can just kind of pay five mana and get a giant creature, all the while you are exiling cards from the top of your library. Um, just a note, then um, you can pay just two mana with Ibrahim to return a card with a study counter on it, so that's kind of interesting. You don't actually have to pay anything into X if you don't want to start milling yourself, but um, yeah, I think this has a lot of potential, and it really shows how they work together, but in different ways, and I think this is really what they are going for, and I don't really see it as much in the other ones. Next we have Shally, Dean of Radiance. It's a two-cost white legendary creature bird cleric 1-1. One, one. Another cheaper one. Flying and Vigilance. Tap, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature that entered the battlefield under your control this turn. So it wants to put lots of things, uh, counters on things. Ambrose, Dean of Shadow. Four cost, four, four. Uh, tap, put a plus one, plus one counter on another target creature. Then he deals two damage to that creature. So it's letting you uh, kind of use it either as removal so you can kind of tap and have him deal one damage to a creature but if he doesn't kill the creature he does you know th that creature does get bigger over time so it's kind of an interesting dynamic but then you also count for whenever a creature you control with like plus one plus one counter on it dies draw a card um yeah these two don't necessarily want to go in the same deck outside of i mean i guess a plus one plus one counter deck um but you need to make sure your creatures can survive the hit embro seems more like he could play on his own and have a more interesting strategy whereas whereas shally seems to really only want to be with plus one plus one counters um but i guess you can maybe throw that into like a white yeah, actually, it has flying and vigilance. That could actually go into mono white pretty easily. I mean, 1-1 one, one flyer, you swing in with it, you deal a little bit of damage, you put a counter on everything that ETB'd. Pretty good, actually. And the fact that, um, and I just read this. Oh my god, Ambrose is insane. Whatever creature you control with a plus one, plus one counter on it dies, draw a card? Okay, if you're running a plus one, plus one counter deck in black, this is definitely going in it. Um, I thought it was like only to that first ability. No, that's pretty cool. Next, we have a non-Dean, but it is a modal double face card, but it's not two legendary creatures. It is a creature and a sorcery. It is a four-cost blue creature, Merfolk Wizard 2-2, two -two, with Ward 2. Uh, it's essentially, in order to target this card, it requires... it. Well, this card... Okay, if anything targets this, they, your opponent has to pay two mana, otherwise the thing that's targeting it gets countered. Either way, when it enters the battlefield, exile an instant or sorcery card from your graveyard, put a number of plus one plus one counters on Torrent Sculptor equal to half that card's mana value rounded up, put big stuff in your graveyard, exile it, that's kind of interesting, um, not something I necessarily would want to do, but maybe it's a good payoff, the issue is a lot of the decks I build that throw instants in the graveyard actually want them to be there so that I can do some other effect, and that's a common thing for is it and I guess, I'm talking about is it the color here, or color combination, not the guild, um, to do. Either way, then we have Flamethrower Sonata. It's a two-cost red sorcery. Discard a card, then draw a card. Um, by the way, that says discard a card, then draw a card. So if you have no cards in hand when you cast this, you don't discard, but you still draw. Kind of interesting. When you discard an instant or sorcery card this way, it deals damage equal to that card's mana value to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So you are going to want to discard something, but if you don't have something and you just want to kind of cycle this for two mana, you can. Um, actually, that's not bad. Again, you're trying to throw things in your graveyard. Um... That now, unfortunately, a lot of the time you want a spell that's going to count as an instant or sorcery in your graveyard. 
Um, I actually think this card would have been better if the flamethrower was on the front because then it goes to the graveyard You just maybe you'd probably discarded an instant or sorcery card now you threw two instant and sorceries in the graveyard And then pretty interesting things can happen from there You threw two things in the graveyard But it also means that torrent sculptor could exile another torrent sculptor and enter with a plus one plus one counter I think throwing that on the front would have been made the card better, but uh, Whatever, it's fine Next, we have Rowan Scholar of Sparks and Will Scholar of Frost. They are modal double face planeswalkers. They are twins. Every single time we've seen them, some part of them being twins has been a part of it. In Battle Bond, they had partner. In Throne of Eldraine, they shared a card. And here, they are modal double faced. Either way, Rowan is a three cost, two loyalty, red, legendary planeswalker. And it says instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. Actually, both of them say that. So you're going to be getting that effect no matter which side you play. But then you can plus one her to deal one damage to each opponent. If you've drawn three or more cards this turn, she deals three damage to each opponent instead. Interesting in a deck that's going to be drawing lots of card, maybe one that's cycling through their deck using Magecraft and creating treasures every time they cast a spell. I don't know. Uh, either way, plus one dealing three damage to each opponent's not bad. Minus four, you get an emblem with. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may pay two. If you do copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. Pretty good in a deck or in a deck with Magecraft. Um, you essentially make all your spells too more expensive, but then you get two of the effect, plus you get to trigger Magecraft twice, and your instant and sorcery spells cost one less to cast anyway, so yeah, pretty good. Uh, it only takes two turns after she comes out. I guess you you play her, plus one, the next turn, plus one, the next turn, alt, um, to do that. And then Will Scholar of Frost, five cost blue legendary planeswalker Will. Uh, instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less, like we said. It enters with four loyalty, and you can plus one, and up to one target creature has base power and toughness 0-2 until your next turn. Pretty awesome, because it is a defensive thing. Like, Rowan does not defend herself in any way. She's dealing damage, but not to creatures. This is saying, hey, you have this big, scary, trampley thing that's gonna come kill me? Actually, it's a 0-2 now. And that's pretty cool. I mean, it can also technically target your own stuff, so if you want to block a 1-1 with something that's normally a 1-1, one, one, or maybe a 0-1 or something weird, you can make it a 0-2. And then you can minus 3 to draw 2 cards. Um, honestly, not awful. I mean, it does leave him stranded at 1 loyalty, but uh, pretty... You know, normally that would say, like, draw 1 card, uh, and maybe he would have started at 5 loyalty, but it's draw 2 and he starts at 4. And then minus seven, exile up to five target permanents for each permanent exiled this way. Its controller creates a four for a blue and red elemental creature token. So we're seeing blue do more of this exile and turn into something else. Now it can exile lands. So it's now land now, or land. Blue has access to destroying every single permanent type now. Um, of course, this is a Planeswalker ult, so I don't really think you can say this is breaking the color pie just because you have to get him down. He basically starts at five because you plus one him, and then two turns later, you've finally got him up to seven, and then that third uh, turn later, you can finally ult him, and if you do exile five other things, you just gave them 20 power, or you exile your own stuff, and you get 20 power, but honestly, that ult's not super impressive. I mean, the fact that you can maybe get rid of their really scary stuff, and then maybe get yourself some interesting things, um, maybe you get rid of one of your lands, and maybe one of your, like, more useless creatures, turn them into four fours. I almost wish they had haste, because that way, when you did it on your turn, you could see some immediate impact because you could legit ult into a board wipe and just nothing happened if you did it on your stuff or you could do it on your opponent's stuff and accidentally give them lethal uh so i don't necessarily love the alt there um yeah next we have a shadrix silver quill this is one of the elder dragons it's a five cost azorius legendary creature elder dragon two five all the other elder dragons by the way are three colors so now we're getting a cycle of two color ones that's kind of cool either way it's a two five with flying and double strike at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may choose two. Each mode must target a different player. Target player creates a 2-1 white and black inkling creature token with flying. Target player draws a card and loses one life. Or target player puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature they control. So that seems really interesting. The big thing here is it says you must choose two. You either choose nothing or two. And what that means is if you're in a 1v1, your opponent is getting a good effect. Now, you get to choose what that effect is. Um, so maybe you have them draw a card. But that's pretty good. Maybe make them make a 2-1 with flying. Well, then they're probably going to block Shadrix. I mean, he can kill them on the first strike, but yeah. And then put up counter and everything. That's not good. 
So essentially, this is one of those cards where you're helping your opponent and it honestly feels more suited towards commander where you can be like helping out the person who's maybe falling a little bit behind while also getting some crazy good value. Um, but I don't know, this just doesn't seem that interesting to me in commander either. I mean, normally there's some splashy effect and yes, this is kind of a splashy effect, but it's like combat on your turn. I, I almost wish this just said combat and you might say that's really powerful, but you have to give your opponent something. And so if you can do it twice per turn, yeah, that's pretty good. Um, but also your opponent's getting some benefit out of it. And so I think this card is kind of lame in my opinion. It, it, you don't really get to do anything that interesting in commander and in standard it's a one V one. So yikes, this card's not great. Uh, it's maybe, Maybe, like, with Rankle, you never see people drawing cards unless they're going to use that to do that one extra damage, and that's about the only thing I could see this card doing. So, I may be horribly wrong, but, yeah, um, not a fan. Either way, then we also have the lands. Uh, so, these are finishing off the, I forgot what they're called, maybe battle lands. Uh, so, essentially, when you play, when they enter the battlefield, you can reveal a plains or swamp from your hand. If you do, they enter untapped. If you don't, they enter tapped. So, another land that can enter untapped, pretty good right now in standard with triomes. However, we also have uh, pathways and temples that don't have the types, and we also have the snow basics, or the snow... Um, things that do. So I don't know actually how good these are. I think it really depends on how you're building your mana base. Next we have uh, the lessons. So we're going to go through all the lessons now outside of the one that we covered earlier. Pest summoning, three cost, sorcery, it's in black and green, uh, but it's hybrid, so you can be in either green or black. Create two one one black and green pest creature tokens with when this creature dies, you gain one life. Again, that's pretty good. I mean, anything that tells you to go learn, oh, you need chump blockers? Go get them. Oh, you need sacrifice fodder? Go get them. Um, just a note, lessons don't work in commander unless you allow them to. So unless you um, kind of talk with your group and say, yeah, this can happen, they don't work. Next, we have Introduction to Annihilation. This is a pretty crazy card, in my opinion. Either way, it's a five cost sorcery. It's colorless. Exile target non-land permanent. Its controller draws a card. So yeah, they do get to replace it, and it is five cost, but a five cost spell that just says exile target non-land permanent? I mean, for four and a white, that's a little bit expensive. But the fact that this is colorless, I would have expected this to be like a six cost spell. And the fact that you can have this in your sideboard, and if you really need to exile something, do it in, you know, red? That's crazy. Or green? You know, these are colors that aren't necessarily supposed to get access to this, and yes, it's a little bit risky and stuff, but you don't actually have to invest to putting it in your deck. You put it in your sideboard, so I think this is a pretty good card. Next, we have Introduction to Prophecy, 3-cost Sorcery, Scry 2, then Draw a Card. Uh, comparing this to Divination, you know, 3-cost Blue Spell, Draw 2 Cards. Uh, scrying 2 and then Drawing Card isn't that far off, and so for something like White, this could actually be a card that sees play in something like Commander. I know Divination doesn't see play, but White uh, can sometimes need the help, um, especially also decks that are combo decks that don't run blue, uh, though they may also like this card. Next, we have Expanded Anatomy, 3 cost sorcery, uh, put, a pl put 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters on target creature, it gains Vigilance until end of turn. Again, you can kind of do some shenanigans with this not being in the correct color, um, but it's not nearly as interesting as the other ones. And that is it for this video. It has been an incredibly long one, probably one of the longest videos on my channel, and we still have the Mystical Archives to talk about. Uh, and so what I may do, and I don't know yet, uh, I, I may be pushing those to tomorrow, and I'll just talk about all of them tomorrow, just because the amount of talking I've done today, I don't know if you can hear, but I think I'm starting to lose my voice, which is not a good thing right before spoiler season starts. So I may give my voice a little bit of a break, so it'll either come out either later today or tomorrow. Either way, guys, if you enjoyed, hit that like button, subscribe, hit the notification bell to stay up to date with everything Magic and Strixhaven's. Strixhaven's? Strixhaven. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.